Good morning, everyone. Okay, we might be small, but we can definitely be mighty, and you know how I roll. So let's try one more time. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Yay, good morning. Welcome. It is so lovely to have you all here and to beat the heat because it's kind of gross and sticky. So um, thank you for coming, and welcome to those online too. So most of you know, my name is Carolyn. I'm one of the elders, which you also know I like to be called. <laughs> Hello. Um, a young'un, not an elder. Um, so that's just also how I roll. We have the land acknowledgement up there, but we're going to center our hearts and our minds on who is important today, which is, which is everyone here, but is God. And so if you could join me in the call to worship, which hopefully you can see on the screen. Um, so I will read what is in white, but in your super big, loud, happy summer voices, if you could read what is in yellow, that would be awesome. Here we go. The prophets of old spoke of God's justice, even when it was unwelcome. Who will hear their message? We will listen and we will hear. Responding to God's call, Jesus traveled, preaching and teaching all who would listen. Who will hear his message? We will listen and we will hear. Christ sent out disciples two by two to spread the good news in any place. Who will hear their message? We will listen and we will hear. God's prophets are among us still, around the world and in these pews. Who will hear their message? We will listen and we will hear. I love it. Thank you. What's up guys, it's your girl Jade here and welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today I have some really exciting news. I'm going to be working at Amberley Presbyterian Church as a summer camp counselor this year. Today I'm going to be showing you guys a day in the life of what it's like to be a summer camp counselor. So if you like this video, make sure to like and subscribe and turn on those post notifications. Alright, let's go. Is that a slide? And a foosball table? And an air hockey table? Let my people go. Please, that voice sounds familiar. Let my people go. Let my people go. What are you doing? Rashad? Hey, good. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Yeah, I'm just practicing uh, my storytelling so you know we can engage the kids and uh, make the story come alive for them. Wow, it sounds really good. Are you Moses? I am Moses. Are you vlogging right now? Yeah, say hi to my people. Hi guys, my name is Krishan and this is my first year at Emberley. I'm looking excited to be here and doing storytelling. That's great. Oh, what? This looks like fun. What's going on over here? Hey, what are you doing? Hi, I'm vlogging for my YouTube channel. Oh my gosh, hi. hi. I'm Neha. I'm just dancing for the worship today. This is my second year back, and I'm so excited to be here. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, come dance with me. Okay. Wow, this camp is going to be so much fun. Yeah, if you think this is fun, we have games, we have Bible stories, we've got crafts, we've got activities. And we've even got science experiments on Fridays. Ooh, science experiments. All right, so if you're excited for this summer, make sure to like and subscribe and comment down below what you're most looking forward to. See you this summer. summer. Can you hear me? Oh, there you go. Oh, so uh, yes, uh, that was our intro video. And um, if you guys don't know, I was Moses in that video. Um, so um, I'm very happy to be here and see everyone here today. And my, my family's here as well, so good to see them. Uh, I got Jade here with me, and she's going to be here for support. So uh, yeah, <laughs> it's going to be good. Thank you. So uh, my name is Krishan. And I'm in my fourth year of university at the U University of Toronto Scarborough campus. And I'm studying business and specializing in finance. So, uh, and this summer, I just didn't do no school or anything. I just wanted to kind of focus on work and uh, co-ops. And, and this opportunity, like my mom was the one that uh, put me for this opportunity. And uh, I really enjoyed it. I'm happy to be a counselor this year. And the first two weeks were amazing. Uh, last week it was very uh, hectic. We had 30 kids. but. Uh, it was very fun, and I really enjoyed it. Um, one uh, last week, we did um, the like, themes of the Bible, so we did the Inside Out theme, and it was kind of like on like sadness, joy, fear, envy, and anger. 
And uh, for my story, I started off the week and I did The Walls of Jericho, Joshua and the Walls of Jericho for fear. So it was very good. And with that story, uh, there was a lot of kids that asked questions, which was the highlight of our week, right? Like kids asking us questions and being curious about like God's word, Jesus, the stories that we all grew up listening to as kids, right? So that was the highlight this week. And this coming week, we're going to be doing the spies of the Bible. So we're going to be going into Rahab and the spies, Joshua and Caleb, uh, Gideon and the Mennonite ca uh, camp. So this week is going to be fun. And we have some fun themes coming up this week, fun activities and games for the kids. So it's going to be amazing. Um, something for us to, like for us, just keep us in your prayers, like me and Jade and our leader, uh, Neha, which is not here today. but. Keep us in your prayers, uh, allow us to have a fun week with the kids, and hopefully kids ask more questions this week and be more, uh, I guess, encouraged to ask more questions and not feel awkward, right? So, and we love to help, we love to talk to them, and um, yeah, so I'm very excited for this upcoming week to spend time with the kids and uh, today to do Kids Zone today, so it's gonna be fun, and um, I guess I can just lead us in a quick prayer and we can continue on. Uh, before I do prayer, uh, after I finish prayer, we're going to go downstairs for uh, Kids Zone, so Sunday school. So, like, all the kids, please come with me, and we're going to have some fun downstairs. Okay, perfect. All right, let's bow our heads. Dear Holy Father, Lord, I just thank you for this day, Lord. I just thank you for bringing us here today, Lord, on this bright uh, Sunday morning, Lord. And uh, to all of us here, come here safely, Lord. I just thank you for providing for us. Thank you for this past two weeks of summer camp we've had. Thank you for the success, and thank you for the amount of kids that come and all them enjoying themselves, Lord. And kids asking questions, Lord, is a very good sign for us to see, Lord. And uh, we pray that uh, more kids are curious, Lord. More kids are asking questions, Lord. And give us um, the wisdom, Lord, and knowledge to be able to uh, talk to these uh, kids, Lord, and preach to them, Lord, and show them what we learned as, as us growing up, right? So, uh, Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you for us today, Lord. I just thank you for... Um, Bring us here today, Lord, safely, Lord. I just thank you for uh, always providing for us, Lord. And just continue to bless uh, the sermon, Lord, and bless the rest of the service, Lord. And pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, guys. Have all the kiddies? I'm sure some of the grown-ups want to go, too, because that sounds fun down there. <laughs> so, um, so a big thank you to the, the kids' camp team. They're doing an amazing job. They also do need snacks because kids eat a lot. Um, and so if anyone is uh, willing to bring in some snacks, some cookies, uh, individually wrapped, please do so. I'm sure juice boxes and things like that are also um, very welcomed. Uh, just one other quick announcement um, is we do have the Broadway kids that come and apparently they did an, a fantastic show uh, last Friday, and it's free. And the next one is on July the 26th at 4 here, and they do lots of wonderful singing. So if you have time and you feel you want to be inspired with a bit of Broadway razzle-dazzle, come here at 4 on July the 26th. And I think that's it for the announcements. Anyone? No? Going, going, gone? Okay. Dear Father Jesus, here we are in summer, taking time off from school, work, taking weekends up north or away or traveling, enjoying the sunshine, the warmth, the water, and the fun being together. Thank you that we get to have these moments, moments that are memories forever, and may we treasure them. You never get time off. You're always sitting close beside each one of us, even when we don't notice you or feel you, you're right here. You are holding our hearts in your hand and slowly guiding us, carrying us when we can't even feel you lift us up. Please help us to learn to see and feel you, not just in the dark and sad times, but in the joyful. When our minds are distracted with what is good, when we're eating cheese, laughing with others, being with those we love and care about, Help us to pause and see and feel you and be grateful for the wonders that you bring us. Help us to be grateful every day for the big things, but also the little. For the fact that we actually wake up and have the gift of another day. May we also be grateful for those tough times and people in our lives, for they are our biggest teachers. From them we learn how not to be, 
how to be better, kinder, more loving and compassionate. Strip us farther of our egos that hold us back from being our best selves and help us to honour you every day by loving one another, even those who are difficult, and loving the world you gave us. Help us to respect and honour you by seeing the beauty in the colour of the flowers, the green of the grass, the brightness of the blue skies, and not by wasting and polluting. Help us not just to think, but also to do and to be better. Please help us to lift one another up, whether it be by a smile or holding someone's hand or being there when they need them. There are many people here today who are hurting from sadness, fear, loneliness, a sense of being unwell or not themselves. Help them to hear and feel you now, that their burden might be lightened, lifted up to you, and that they know in the deepest parts of their soul that you are loved, they are loved by you and by us. We pray for our community and the world, Lord. There is so much darkness and anger in people's hearts. We pray for the plight still of the Ukrainians. Give them strength and courage and please stop the war. We pray for the political turmoil in the US that is out of hand and ask that you bring peace to all those involved and take the heat out of the fire. We pray that the leaders in our countries have wisdom, compassion, and put people and you first. Thank you for all you do, Father. Thank you for loving us and forgive us where we fall by the wayside. Help us to see you every day, to shine brighter and sparkle, and to shower others with love like you do with us. We love you, Lord. Amen. Morning. How are we this morning? Good? It's, it's okay, right? It's cool in here. It's nice in here, right? Yeah, it's lovely, lovely, lovely. You never know. Um, welcome. Welcome to those of you who are uh, visiting with us for the first time. So delighted that you're here. Welcome, welcome. Uh, welcome to those of you who are always here. And, and welcome to those of you who are joining us online. So delighted that you tuned in today. Last, uh, last week, we started um, a new series called Finding God's Will. So just to review very, very quickly, we said that God's will can be found in three contexts. The, we, we talked about the providential will of God and the moral will of God, and we talked about the personal will of God. The providential will of God being that God is going to do what God is going to do because God is God, right? And the moral will of God is the things that God has instructed us to do or not to do. That's the moral will of God. And, and God is going to guide us according to his providential will and his moral will, and somewhere in between there, there are guidelines where we will find God's will, God's direction for our lives, for our personal, the personal will of God. But that requires patience. It requires for us to spend time in God's word, right? And, and it takes time to, to learn what the providential will of God has been and what will be. And what happens if we're not familiar with the Bible? Maybe we're new to the faith or we just need to know the will of God. I mean, we need to know now, right? We couldn't possibly, we couldn't possibly read and process, you know, God's word by Thursday because that's, that's when we have to make this big decision. So what do we do? What do we do? This morning, what I want to do is look at the book of First King because I think there is a principle illustrated in there that is so clear. It's so obvious, so important, and it, it amazes me how often we just tend to overlook it. 
When I read this, I am reminded that God wants for us to know the will of God, maybe even more than we want to know, right? Um, and, and God gives us some principles, some very clear principles on on um, what to follow, how to follow, and how to help us find that. Now, in 1 Kings chapter 12, we're going to read a story about a would-be king who stumbled upon this principle and completely ignored it. But before we get to the story, uh, let's pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts bring glory and honor to you, O rock and our redeemer. Amen and amen. Okay, let me give you a little bit of background. This is very, very cool. Okay, first king of Israel. Would you happen to know who that might be? Saul. Okay, the first king of Israel was, a, was an, um, a man by the name of Saul, and he didn't do very well. He was not a great king. God replaced Saul with David. Now, David did very well. He did very, very well. And then David's son, Solomon, followed him as king of Israel. Now, Solomon did okay at the beginning of his reign, but eventually he turned his heart away from God toward his foreign wives and their gods, okay? And God said to Solomon, Solomon, you've disappointed me greatly, and consequently, I'm going to tear apart uh, your kingdom from you and your family, I'm letting you keep a part of it because I made a promise to your father, David, uh, but you've disobeyed me and you've dishonored me. And God said to Solomon, I'm going to wait until after you're gone before I do that because I want to honor your father, David. God also, at the same time, sent a prophet to a man by the name of Jeroboam. And he made the same prophecy to him. The prophet says to Jeroboam, Solomon's kingdom is going to be divided and I'm going to give you, Jeroboam, a large portion of it and you and your followers are going to rule half of the nation of Israel. Well, King Solomon heard about this. He heard about the prophecy that was given to Jeroboam and he was not a happy camper right? And so he planned to chase Jeroboam. He wanted to chase him down and was going to kill him because he didn't want, he didn't want anyone coming along after he was dead, stealing, stealing the legacy that belonged to his son, who should then be king, right? Jeroboam heard that the king was after him. And so he took off and hid in Egypt, Okay, you with me so far? Time went on, as time does. And eventually Solomon died, and everyone assumed that his son, Rehoboam, not Jeroboam, Rehoboam, would become king of Israel. And not only did they assume he would become king, they thought he would be the best choice for king. So here's where the story picks up. The nation has sent representatives to crown Rehoboam king of Israel and begin some negotiations. And they make one simple request. And that is where this kind of just sets us up for the principle that we're going to talk about in 1 King 12, verses 1 to 4. This is how it reads. Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel had gone there to make him king. Then Jeroboam, son of Nebat, Heard, hit, heard this, he was still in Egypt where he had fled from King Solomon. He returned from Egypt. So they went, they sent for Jeroboam and he and the whole assembly of Israel, these are the representatives of the Nor northern tribes, went to Rehoboam and said to him, okay, so this is what's happening. Jeroboam, who was summoned back from Egypt, is now with the northern leaders, and they appear now before the newly crowned king. And this is what they say in verse 4. Your father put a heavy yoke upon us, but now lighten the harsh labor and the heavy yoke put on us, and we will serve you. 
The word serve is key in this whole passage. They say, if you'll just lighten up, if you'll just, you know, lighten the workload because your, you know, your dad, we, we bore the brunt of your dad's, you know, high demands. There was all these endless building projects and, and it was hard. Your, da your, your dad was so hard on us, you know, high taxes and forced labor. You know, if you could just chill a little, we're going to serve you. We'll serve you happily. So here is Rehoboam in a defining moment in his life. The people said, we want you as king. We, we want you as king, and we're all ready to serve, but your father was too harsh, so we want a different kind of king. Now, Rehoboam had a decision to make, and from our vantage point, we may just say, well, hey, that's easy. Just say, sure, I'll lighten up, and sure, I'll be a good king, but there was a lot at stake for Rehoboam. Rehoboam Boam, um, could have said, you know, I'll lighten up. But that, if he did say that, it might suggest that he's a weak leader. He was a young man. He didn't have any experience. He didn't have skill or, or certainly the wisdom of his father. So here he is facing the representatives, and he had a decision to make. Now, what does he do? He does a very smart thing. He asks for some time. Listen to this, verse 5. Rehoboam answered, go away for three days and then come back to me. So the people went away. Okay. Now, he did the thing that a lot of us need to learn to do when we have to make a big decision. Like we've got to, you know, we have to make that decision now. And there's so much at stake. And there's so much pressure and so much emotion that we can't often see clearly. Rehoboam does a very important thing. And that is he looked for counsel from wise, older people. And God spoke through those people. Listen to verse 6. Then King Rehoboam consulted the elders who had served his father Solomon during his lifetime. How would you advise me to answer these people, he asked. So Rehoboam went to the older people who had the benefit of watching his father rule. They saw the mistakes that his father made. They saw the consequences of those mistakes. They saw the good decisions that his father had made and the rewards of those decisions. They had a great perspective. They were older. They were wiser. And so he goes to them and he says, what should I do? Verse 7. They replied, if today you will be a servant to those people and serve them, <clears throat> excuse me, and give them a favorable answer, they will always be your servants. They gave him some pretty wise, godly counsel. Verse 8, but Rehoboam rejected the advice the elders gave him and consulted the young men who had grown up with him and were serving with him. In other words, he consulted his friends, his peers, a group of people that had a lot at stake in terms of what happened to Rehoboam, right? Because if Rehoboam was rich and powerful, then guess what? His friends are going to be rich and powerful too, right? Verse 9, he asked them, what's your advice? How should we, now notice he uses the word we because he's already biased. How should we answer these people who say to me, lighten the yoke your father put on us? The young men who had grown up with him replied, these people have said to you, your father put a heavy yoke on us, but make our yoke lighter. Now tell them, my little finger is thicker than my father's waist, which is a figurative way of saying you think my dad was bad. Just wait, right? My father laid a heavy yoke on you. I will make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips. I will scourge you with scorpions. Verse 12. Three days later, uh, uh, Jeroboam and all the people returned to Rehoboam. As the king had said, come back to me in three days. Verse 13, the king answered the people harshly, rejecting the advice given to him by the elders. He followed the advice of the young men and said, my father made your yoke heavy. I will make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips. I will scourge you with scorpions. Now listen to this. So the king did not listen to the people 
for his turn of events was from the Lord to fulfill the word the Lord has spoken to Jeroboam, son of Nebat, through Ahijah the Chilamite. It's a bit complicated, but just hang on. Let's see if we can work through this. Here we have an amazing illustration of the providential will of God blending with a person who is trying to make the right decision. And now there may be a sense that Rehoboam was set up for failure because God had already decided that the kingdom will be divided, but God fulfilled his providential will through the free choice of Rehoboam. On one hand, this is an unbelievable example of how the two blend together. And there's this reminder to us that there are some things that God is just going to do. And the wisest thing that we can do is to learn to cooperate with the providential will of God. The other principle, this is really important for us. The other principle that this story illustrates is the value of going to other people for counsel and advice. One of the primary tools that God is going to use in your life and in mine is to, uh, the way he's going to guide us is the counsel of other believers. And here's why. Many times we're forced to make a decision about things that are so close that we can't be objective. Oftentimes we're, we're asked to make a decision about a relationship. And with relationships, there's always emotion. And emotion has a tendency to cloud our reason and our decision-making ability. If you've ever been in love, love is a fog, man, right? <laughs> we make some silly, sometimes very bad decisions when we're in love, right? If you've ever had to make a decision about a family member, you know how difficult and complex it can be, right? To be objective. Sometimes we have to make decisions about things that are just our head. Maybe you're new in, in business and, and you, have, you have to make a decision, uh, about a business decision, and you just don't have the answer because you don't know what you need to know. So oftentimes there's decision-making environments that are so complex and so complicated and sometimes fraught with emotion that finding time to delve into God's word, to find guidance, it's just really hard. And if you're a new Christian, trying to make sense of the Bible to find a quick, you know, quick direction seems absolutely impossible. So God made it simple. God has put godly people in your midst. We have one another. And just like no member of my physical body operates independently, we have not been left to make decisions independently. God has given us the body of Christ in order to facilitate decision-making process. Interesting that the person who says the most about this in the scriptures is Rehoboam's father, Solomon. Solomon at one time was the wisest person ever that ever lived. You know, there's a story about a president who had a dream. Uh, and, and God visited him in a vision. And the vision, uh, he was given a choice. He could have the wealth of Solomon. He could have the fame of of Solomon. He could have the wisdom of Solomon. Word soon spread that the president had received the wisdom of Solomon. His cabinet quickly convened to hear the, the wisest man that ever lived and what he would say. And they waited breathlessly as he began to speak. And he said, I should have taken the money. <laughs> Solomon said this, Proverbs 11, verse 14, for lack of guidance, a nation falls, but victory is won through many advisors. Another, another thing Solomon says, the way of fools seems right to them, but the wise listen to advice. Verse 15, uh, ch sorry, chapter 15, verse 22, plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. Finding God's will for our lives. Scripture is important. Prayer is important. But God has given us 
uh, of another very sound, very practical way of getting good, sound advice, guidance, and direction. He has, he has given us one another. And I know that there might be those of you who say, well, you know, I did seek counsel and I got some really bad advice. Well, Rehoboam is case in point of that. He got very bad advice and it caused, it caused the split in the nation. But here's the thing. The issue is not should we listen or not listen or does God speak that way or not speak that way. God does speak through people and we need to learn to listen. But we need to establish some boundaries around who we listen to and how we listen. So let me give you three basic principles on who we seek counsel from. Number one, number one, when it comes to hearing from God, choose someone who has nothing to lose by telling you the truth. Okay? The problem with Rehoboam is that his friends had a lot to lose. And, and a lot of us in this room have the same kind of friends. We have friends who are more concerned about the friendship than they are about you as a friend. So they're going to tell us whatever we need, you know, we need them to tell us to make sure that nothing happens to the relationship rather than telling us what we really need to hear. Number two, choose someone who is where you want to be in life. Someone who is further ahead and has wisdom about how they got there. So if it's a marriage, say, if it's a marriage concern, go to someone whose marriage you admire. If it's a financial decision, go to someone who's figured all of that out. The problem is oftentimes we will ask people who are no further down the road than we are. And, and chances are that the bad advice that you've gotten, even from professionals, they may have been a little older, uh, maybe a little more educated, but, but in terms of where you want to be, they may likely not have been any further along than you are. What Rehoboam did right in this story is that he went to people who had been there, who had done that. They watched the king operate for 40 years, right? They had context for that decision. But his friends were no more, they had no more context than he did. And clearly, they had more interest in the relationship, when Brian and I were first married, we attended a small group uh, at a home of the Waltons. Oh, my gosh. This dear, dear couple. And it w they'd been married 40 years at that time. And we were just starting out. And they were married 40 years. And we joined their little agape group, it was called. Um, and we learned so much from this godly couple. Week after week, um, they shared life with us. And, and um, it was nothing... It was nothing short of life-changing. They, they were what I aspired to. They were happily married. Oh, they were grumpy and chattering and blah, 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 but they loved each other deeply. Their kids were amazing. They had beautiful grandchildren. They had a cottage, which Brian aspired to. Uh, they loved God. They served God. They worked hard. They were successful. And I watched how they loved each other. And I was humbled by how they loved us. When we sought counsel from them, let me tell you, we listened. We leaned in because we wanted to hear what they had to say. Number three, if possible, ask more than one person if you can. Okay? It's always better to ask uh, more than one person. And if you can have one person that knows you really well and another person that doesn't, it's even better. As you seek counsel, be sensitive and prepared that God might speak to you. I wouldn't, I wouldn't call them up and say, hey, let's meet at 7.30. I've asked God to speak through you. That will just weird them out. <laughs> because it's not in our control, right? And it's about letting God use godly people in our midst. After you tell your story and you vi voice your concern or your dilemma or whatever it is, ask some questions of them like, are any of the options I'm considering outside the boundaries of Scripture as far as you know? Are any of the options I'm considering outside of the boundaries of Scripture as far as you know? Another question you might want to ask is what do you think is the wise thing for me to do? Often what we do 
depth are not moral issues, but rather questions like, do we move or do we invest or, you know, that kind of stuff. And scripture says, he who trusts in his own heart is a fool. He who walks wisely will be delivered. And through God, through wisdom, God delivers us from a, an awful lot of bad decisions. The third question I would ask is, what would you do if you were me? That's, I always ask that question of wise people. What would you do if you were me? Based on what you've been through in life, based on what you know, if you were me, what would you do? If you're selective in who you ask and you ask strategic questions, you will be amazed how many times God will use the body of Christ to give you guidance and direction. And let me tell you, this is not a less spiritual approach. This is not a nothing else works kind of approach. This is central core kind of stuff. And do you know the number one reason why we don't do this? Pride. Pride, because we figure we should be able to figure all of this out on our own. We figure we should, you know, lean on our own understanding, but we already know how that can turn out, right? Right? God uses his people as a way to speak to us, but we need to be willing to get involved in that process. Is it harder for men? <laughs> you know, there are loads of jokes about men not wanting to ask directions. It doesn't have to be. Great leadership is not about making the decisions on your own, but about owning the decisions once it's been made. God has given us one another and God is willing to speak to the people that God has put around us. And if we will learn this principle to be careful who we go to and ask the right questions, because, because our Father in heaven wants us to know his will for our lives. And we can find the will of God if we learn to listen. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, thank you. Thank you for providing your people in our midst. And I pray that we will become more and more a community that can speak through, through to us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I'm going to invite Carolyn to come up and receive the tithes and offering. Thanks, Carolyn.